In this video, we want to investigate what the first singular homology group has to say about a topological space. And since the first singular homology is defined in terms of one simply sees, which is nothing but paths in the space, there can be, or one can sort of already think that it might be somehow related to an earlier object we introduced, namely the fundamental group. And this is precisely what um, the theorem of this video will say. So for formulating it, let me first of all um, recall that we can identify paths with singular one simplices as we already did in the previous video. So if we have such a path, call it f from the standard, from the unit interval into x, then we can interpret it, interpret this path so interpreted as a singular one simplex just by identifying the standard one simplex with the unit interval. And if we interpret it as such a singular one simplex, then such um, a singular one simplex is a cycle precisely if the path is a loop, All right? We precisely when the starting um, point and the end point coincide. So interpret it as a singular one simplex is a cycle if and only if the path is a loop. Meaning f of zero is equal to f of one, the same point in x. Okay, and this um, very easy remark allows one to formulate the theorem which will clarify the relation between the fundamental group and the first singular homology. And that's the following theorem called the Hurewicz Hure theorem in degree one, say, because there is a more general version of it, which I don't know if we'll see it this semester, maybe, maybe not. But no, we'll probably not. <laughs> probably not. Okay, so we'll see it, the degree one version of it. Hurevich theorem in degree one. And this has the following. I can now define a map. First of all, a map from the fundamental group of X, where we take some fixed base point X naught. And from there we go to the first singular homology of x, yeah, but I now want to stress coefficients are in z, yeah, as, as usual. So, yeah, let me remind you that as we introduced singular homology, we just said is, this will, is defined, uh, the chain complex is defined just as the free abelian group over the simplices. So this just corresponds to the singular homology with coefficients in the integers, yeah, this is what's meant here. And how does this map work? Well, we take a loop, yeah, so, a closed a path with the same start and end point. That's our loop here, we call it F. And we only have a homotopy class of um, such loops here in the fundamental group, but we just take any representative and map, consider this representative now as a cycle, as we just said above, yeah? It has the same start and end point. So it's a cycle, singular one cycle, cycle. And we consider its homology class, yeah? So we consider its coset in the one boundaries for which we had introduced notation b1 of x, yeah? So simply you've got the loop in your space, you consider it as a one cycle and therefore it defines an element in the first homology and that's the map, yeah? And of course the Horevich theorem now says that doing this is well defined first of all, yeah? So if I take a different um, loop from the same homotopy class, a homotopic loop, then I will get a homologous one cycle here, yeah? So the two elements will differ by a boundary first assertion. So um, this map is a well-defined, so well-defined is the first assertion. And the second assertion is of course it's not just a map but it's a homomorphism of groups. Yeah. So this is a um, abelian group, this is a um, in general not abelian group but I can still consider homomorphisms of the two, just homomorphism of groups. So it's a well-defined group homomorphism.
And the additional assertion is if the space X is path connected, then actually this homomorphism of groups descends to an isomorphism when we go over to the abelianization of the fundamental group. Okay, that's the second part of the theorem. If X is path connected, path connected, this homomorphism descends to an isomorphism. I should have written this smaller anyway. Um, from the abelianized fundamental group, phi one x, x naught. So we use the notation index AB here for the abelianization. So remember that means we mod out the normal subgroup generated by our commutators in that group. Yeah? So we mod out the commutator subgroup. So then we're left with an abelian group as a quotient group. And the assertion is that our homomorphism from above, um, which we should assign a name to, so since it's the Ravitch um, theorem, let's call it her. And this her homomorphism descends, so abelianizes to a homomorphism to, from the abelianization to H1 sing X. And now, well, under this assumption that is path connected, it not only descends, but it actually descends to an isomorphism. Yeah? So it identifies the abelianized fundamental group with the first singular homology. Okay, so various things need to, need to be addressed here. So we need to address the well-definedness of the map. We need to address whether it's a group homomorphism and then we need to address it descends to the abelianization, assuming that X is path connected. And then we have also have the um, isomorphism statement, so injectivity and surjectivity. So it's like a task list of five points which we have to work through now. So now let's really do the um, well-definedness. So we now assume we've got two homotopic loops. Oh, how do I want to call them? I call them F and G. So now let F and G be two homotopic loops from the fundamental group. So I think this was our notation for homotopy. And let us fix also notation for the homotopy that realizes <laughs> this homotopy between F and G and we call it capital F. So these are homotopic loops, relative endpoints. And we need to show that when we consider them as um, one cycles that they're actually homologous. Meaning we have to construct a two chain, a singular two chain of which um, the difference of these two one cycles is the boundary. Yeah, that's our goal here. And how do we do this? To come up with the two simplex where we need to start with something two dimensional and we get this precisely from the homotopy here. So the homotopy F is a homotopy of loops. So it's defined on I times I yeah, and the Cartesian product of the unit interval with itself. And this is what we will subdivide in a clever way to cook up a two, two chain. So let me sketch this. Subdivide I times I as follows. So we draw I times I as a square like this. And Let's put it like this, that the horizontal um, lines here, this corresponds to F. So that's, so the vertical line is the timeline of the homotopy. So at time zero, we get the, the loop F. And at time one, we get the loop G. And we subdivide it by just um, drawing the diagonal in here like this. So you already um, can see that we get here something like a two chain, yeah, sum of two triangles of two, two so simplices. So on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, it's the constant map, right? And the that's exactly right, yeah. So homotopy relative endpoint means that throughout time, the start point and the end points are fixed. So it's true that actually at the whole left-hand side and at the whole right-hand side, this homotopy just maps to X naught. That's right. And we subdivide this square into two triangles. And let's also give notation for 
um, the occurring data here. So now I want to call about simplices here, so I should give names to the vertices. So let me say this one is V naught, this one is this one is V1, this one is W naught, and this one is W1. Okay, so now I have notation for um, all I need, I guess. No, the diagonal, I want to call it little c. And the left hand, the left hand one simplex here from V naught to W naught, this one I want to call little a. Yeah, so a is the constant um, simplex, mapping everything to x naught. And this one I want to call it v. So the simplex from V1 to W1 is B. Okay, and now I get from the subdivision, I get my two singular two simplices, which I want. So let's call them sigma 2, 1 and sigma 2, 2, I guess. Yeah, or let me just be lazy and drop the, oops, sorry, and drop the um, dimension index up there. So this is just sigma 1. And it's defined, well, by taking our homotopy and restricting it to this, um, which one do I want? V naught, W naught, W1. So by restricting this homotopy to the upper left triangle. So V naught, W1, or V naught, W naught, W1. So remember, the order of vertices is important, yeah? It tells us how we identify this triangle, this two simplex here with the standard two simplex, so that it really defines a two simplex, yeah? So in this order, we map it to the standard two simplex. And similarly, sigma two is supposed to be the other triangle. So we take our homotopy and we restrict it to the lower right triangle, which is spanned by the vertices V naught, V1, and W1. Okay. And now I claim if I take the difference, sigma one minus sigma two, then this is actually a singular two chain whose, um, whose boundary is just um, the difference of F and G, yeah? which would precisely be the statement that those two paths considered as one cycles are homologous. So let's make this calculation. Then D1, oh, sorry, D2, talking about two simplices here, D2 of sigma one minus sigma two. What is this? Oh, we just have to look into the picture. So sigma one, that was um, this upper um, triangle here. So we now have to leave out, we have to omit, omit vertices. So let's omit the first one, then we get we're left with W naught W1, W naught W1. If we look in the picture, that gives us G, and G goes inside with the plus sign because we omitted the zeros vertex. So we just get a G here. Then we omit the first vertex, which is in this case W naught. So if we omit this one, what we get is this one simplex here from V naught to W1. But this gets now a minus sign, and well, it's just C, yeah? So this should be minus C. And finally, if we leave out the third vertex here, W1, then um, what we're left with, so this one is the one we leave out. Cursor is not visible, there it is. Then we get this one here, yeah? So we get um, V naught W1. Oops, did I, I'm confused. V naught, and what do I get? V naught W naught, no, yes, everything's okay. So we get this one, V naught W naught, which is a, and this goes again with a plus sign because we left out the second um, vertex. So that was the boundary of sigma one. And now we also, now we subtract, so I should open parentheses here, the boundary of sigma two. If we leave out the first vertex here, we get V1, W1, V1, W1, that's this one, that's B, with a plus sign. If we leave out the middle vertex, we, we get V naught W1, V naught, W1, that's again the diagonal here, so we get the diagonal with the minus sign. And finally, leaving out the third, or I mean, counting, starting counting from the zero, the second vertex, then we get V naught V1 and V naught V1, that's F with a plus sign. Okay, 
So now let's collect what we got here. We got a minus C here and we got minus cursor come here. There it is. Minus minus C. So the C's cancel out and um, this G remains. Um, right. And the minus F, so here comes the minus sign, remains from here. And what also remains then is A and B, right? So plus A minus B. Okay, so now remember what Roman pointed out. This A1 simplex and B1 simplex, these were just the constant ones which map everything to X naught. So we now use our previous observation, which told us that if we take a path that maps constantly to the space point, it's just gonna be a boundary. So actually um, these two here um, are a boundary. So actually, um, yeah, or Actually, it's even better, isn't it? They're just the same simplex, right? They're just the same they're just the same. Actually, yeah. they're Sorry. zero, yeah. That was too yeah. complicated. Yeah, they're just the same. They just cancel out, right? Because it's the same one simplex. Everything maps to the base point here. Everything maps to the base point C here. The two are subtracted. So this really is just G minus F. Okay. So we now read the equality reversely. G minus F is in the image of D2, meaning G minus F is a boundary. And this is precisely what we wanted to prove. Can I make a remark, Holger? I think there is, um, I mean, the whole proof that you gave reminds very much of the homotopy invariance of singular homology in degree one. It's the prism operator yes. in degree one, right? If you want this picture, what we put here, this is pretty much what we had. Yeah, it's, the sub, it's exactly the subdivision of the prism, yes. Yeah, so, so you want to use this right away. <laughs> we, we could use that right away. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's still, it's, it's good to see this uh, explicitly. But uh, if we want to use the homotopy invariance that we already have proven, we could, um, so maybe I yeah, sure. go to the screen here. We could also argue like that. So side remark using the homotopy invariance in degree one we could look at the map H1, S1 to H1 of X and the induced map by F. So F has many meanings in this proof. So F is a map from S1 to X. Um, we also use it as the corresponding one simplex in X, but here it's uh, as a map from S1 to X. It induces a map from H1, S1 to H1, X. And in H1, S1, there is a one cycle that maps around, wraps around the circle ones. Okay, so that's just the picture for a one cycle and therefore a homology class that it's represented by this one cycle in H1, S1. Yeah, so we computed what H1, S1 is in the video on homology of spheres, but now we also need to know that this is a generator, right? But I think this came out of the way you did it, I guess, right? Uh, we don't need that it's a generator. We just need that this is an element. Oh, okay. And this okay. element is mapped to what you called F plus B1 of X, which is the definition of the Hurevich map um, applied to this element F, now viewed as an element in the, well, Maybe I should write it like that. Now viewed as an element in pi one of x. So it's a bit confusing because all these double meanings um, are now visible in this. But we can now use the homotopy invariance, uh, which tells us that the induced map on homology is the same. So f star is g star, and therefore these two are the same. Yeah, so actually the, yeah, the prison subdivision proof <laughs> repeated in this concrete case, yeah, gives exactly that. So would yeah. have been easier like this. Yeah. yeah, it's the same proof basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that's for the well-definedness part then. And the next thing we have to discuss is that actually the Hurevich uh, map is a homomorphism, yeah? Um, so this is 
something else we need to discuss here. I think this doesn't come out of this. No, this doesn't center. come out of anything we've did so now. Our now because now we really need to use the, well, how the group structure is defined in the fundamental group. So this, I think, yeah, they're really a, a new something argument new. will be yeah. needed. Yeah. Okay, so the homomorphism property, let's take care of that one. Homomorphism. Just right, homomorphism to remind us what we're doing. So, well, we take two elements from the fundamental group, again, F and G. So homotopy classes of loops in here. And, well, what do we have to do? We have to show that, well, first taking their composition in the fundamental group, then applying the Hurevich map gives the same as first applying the Hurevich map to both and then taking the sum of the two in homology. Yeah, this is what we have to show, that this gives the same, and the same meaning the same in homology. So meaning, again, we need to find um, a two cycle of which the respective objects are um, a boundary. And let me write this down. So what are we um, aspiring to do here? To construct, let's take, um, two chain, uh, maybe I said cycle before, two chain, so in this case just a two simplex will be enough if we find such, such two simplex such that its boundary is, and now, well, I first write F um, now as a singular one simplex. I add it with G, so that's sort of the part where we first applied the Gurevich to F and then we applied the rearrange to G and we took the sum of the two. And now we take the difference with, what, with what, we have, what we would have got if we had first taken the composition of the two in the fundamental group and then applied the Hurevich map. And I think um, notation for this was just writing FG one after the other, yeah? So remember, this is now composition as it's defined in the fundamental group. So in twice the velocity, you take half the interval to run along F and then in twice the velocity you take, um, you go along G in the second half of the interval. Yeah, this is what it is. And this would now mean that, well, um, the two are homologous, yeah, if the difference is the boundary of a two simplex, of a two chain. Okay, so how do we get this singular two simplex, which does the job? Well, we get it as follows. So sigma two is, has to be by a definition a continuous map starting at the two simplex. So let's use the standard notation for its vertices, V0, V1, V2. And then we do the following thing. We want to project this to the one simplex, to the face, which I obtain by omitting this, the, sim, the vertex V2. And we do this just by projecting orthogonally. So this is the orthogonal projection. And once we're then there in V0, V1, we compose this map now with FG. Yeah? So on this one simplex V0, V1, on, at the first half we go along F, and the second part we use G to map um, to X now. Okay, so I think I should draw a picture to make precise what I mean here. So here's my standard two simplex with vertices V0, V1 and V2. So now I want the projection to, excuse me, let me see. Now in my notes I confuse the indices. Um, so maybe I want the projection here to V0, V2. Yeah, I think so. V0, V2. Because then I want to draw um, following picture. So I've got here the subdivision of the two simplex in two parts. And at the first part here in V0 to V2, I go along F. At the second part, V0, V2, I go along G. And the map, the projection here is just the orthogonal projection. So I'm, what I wrote here was just where this tip point goes to and all the other ones goes parallel, go parallelly um, towards this one simplex, yeah? So this is the projection. Yeah? 
So what do I do with an element in delta two? I first follow um, this arrow until I arrive here at, at this face. And on this face, depending on whether I'm in the first part or in the second part, I use G or F to map it to X. Yeah? That is the two simplex I'm considering here. All right, and now I claim that this two simplex does what it has to do, so it satisfies the um, equation that I had here. And well, let's just see. D, whoops, of a color. D of sigma two, what is this? So I first drop, um, I first drop the zeros vertex, so I get V1, V2 here. So where do those points go to? Well, I follow these straight lines until I arrive here. So what you see is um, each, this whole, this whole one simplex is in the end just mapped by G to X, yeah? Because you first go along here. So this is sort of stretched here to, to this part of the one simplex. So this is just G. And now I omit the first vertex, this one. What do I get then? Well, then I get this simplex here, and there, there I already know what happens. It's just this composition at G to which this is mapped. So that gets the minus sign because I left out the middle vertex. And finally, if I leave out the second one, then I'm left with this um, face here. Come on, this face here. But again, these points are mapped along the green arrows towards F, so I'm in the end left with F here. Right, and now let's see what we got. Plus F, plus G, minus FG, and this is also what we wanted, yeah? Plus F, plus G, minus FG. So we have verified the equation we needed to, yeah? All right, so this geometric construction gave the homomorphism property of the Hurey bridge map. So this already concludes the first part of the theorem, asserting that we got this homomorphism, and now we'll continue with the second part, which then assumed that the space X is path connected. So let's assume this now. And well, this condition we must use it in some way also, now to come up with an isomorphism on the abelianization. And we use this similarly as we already used um, this property in the video on the degree zero homology. We use it because we can now pick paths from a fixed base point to any other point of the space. So let's do that for each X in X, pick a path. gamma x from the base point x naught to x. So that's possible because x is path connected. And you, using this whole collection of paths which we chose once and for all, we can now define a homomorphism of abelian groups. It's called it psi. And it starts at the first singular homology of x and it ends up at the abelianization of the fundamental group. Yeah, so as you can already guess, what I'm trying to do is, well, I uh, want to cook up, um, I want to cook up an inverse to the Hurevich map here, yeah, sort of it in the end. So let's use this, let's um, consider this homomorphism and how is it defined. So I take a singular, well, one simplex only, I only need to define what it does on a basis, and well, the problem is now I have to come up with a loop, yeah? So I mean, the singular simplex starts at some point in X and ends at some point in X, but I now want to have a loop which starts at X naught and ends at X naught. So what I do is I use my paths to make it a loop. So I start from um, X naught and I go to the initial point of F, so to F naught. Then I walk along F and afterwards I take my path gamma F1 but this by construction or by, by choice had the direction that it started at X naught and goes to F1. Now we need the other direction, so we have to take the reverse path. And this overline was um, the notation we used for taking the um, reverse path. 
And now this just first of all defines um, um, an element in the fundamental group, but I now want to come up with an element in the abelianization. So let me just use the notation AB here, meaning that we do not only consider this loop um, up, to, um, up, to homo up to homotopy, but we consider it also in the quotient of by the commutator subgroup. Yeah? So we consider the coset here of this homotopy class with respect to the commutator subgroup. Okay, so sort of this sits now in a, in a larger equivalence class. Okay, so now we want this psi to define um, a homomorphism in, in homology. So what we have to do is, well, we have to show that psi descends to homology, meaning it needs to vanish on the submodule of boundaries here. And this is the next thing we need to do. So we scroll up. Um, we show that psi vanishes on B1x on the boundaries, on the one boundaries. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, so we now take a two simplex. Yeah, we will then want to show that um, psi vanishes on the boundary of that two simplex. Um, and let's draw a picture of the situation we got here. So maybe a different color. So this is a singular two simplex. So in the space that might be somehow deformed, say it looks like this, something like this, something like this, and something like this maybe. And let's call the faces F, G, and H. And let me draw some lines inside here so to illustrate that actually the image is what well, the image of whole two simplex. So let's fill here in the middle. And then somewhere in the space we've got our base point, say here, x naught. And we have chosen paths from x naught to all points and in particular to the three vertices of the singular simplex. So we've got one like here, one like here, and yet another one going to the third one. This is the situation. And what are these vertices? Well, this is just sigma two, well, um, the first vertex. So if I evaluate it at V naught, this is sigma two of V one, this point of X here, and this is sigma two of V two. Okay. And now if we look at this picture, then we see, um, something that will be very useful now. If I consider the following path, so I go this way along this path from x naught up until I arrive here at sigma two of v1. Then I follow f along this face of the simplex until I arrive at sigma two v2. And then I go back this path to x naught. Then actually this path is homotopic to the path where I go here. And then I go here and then I go here, and then I go back, yeah? Just because I can use the simplex to define my homotopy, yeah? Sort of I go a little more inside here all the time until I arrive here, yeah? So the homotopy can really be defined by, yeah, mapping suitably the square onto this triangle, and then you get this, this homotopy. But I think the picture makes it clear that this, um, these two loops are actually homotopic, so let me, um, put down in writing that they are homotopic. So which, what was that? That was the path which arrived at sigma two V one. So gamma sigma two V one. Then I follow F and then I take gamma sigma two V two, yeah, which is this point here and I go it backwards. Then this one is homotopic. This was our phi sign, I think. Two, I go the same path for path at the start. So gamma sigma two v one, and then I go h in the reverse direction, and then I go g in the correct direction, and then I go this path backwards, which is gamma sigma two v two 
that provides. Okay. And now, what does this mean for our homomorphism psi? Well, it means that um, psi of f, yeah, so let's bring up the definition again. Psi of f, well, that is precisely this path, yeah, from, um, from the start, from the, the base point to the start point, then from the end point back to the um, base point. So this is precisely the path written here. And now um, this is saying, since it's homotopic, that this is the same as psi of the path um, h bar g. So that's this one here. And now, um, right, psi is a homomorphism by construction. Construction. I mean, we only defined it on a basis here, yeah, so it's definitely a homomorphism. So, and I now write, um, since I went as far as the abelianiz abelianization, I now write the group structure in the abelianized fundamental group additively, yeah? So this, to use the homomorphism property, I write this as psi of h bar plus psi of g, yeah? But this is just, this plus is just the composition in the fundamental group, then in the quotient, yeah? After modding out the commutator subgroup. And now, in this abelianized fundamental group, I claim that this psi of h bar, this is actually just the inverse of psi of h plus psi g, this I just copy. So why is that true? Well, psi of h bar, well, h bar, that would be this simplex here. So by a reconstruction of, um, of um, psi, this would be going first this path, then this path, and then this path. And if I, on the other hand, consider h, well, then the image of psi, uh, so psi of h would then be this path, then h, and then this path, yeah? So in other words, it's just the path walked along reversely, and this is what is the inverse according to the group structure of the fundamental group, yeah? So this minus is the additive writing of two to the minus one in the fundamental group here. Okay, so what I gather from this is I have the relation that if I take psi f minus psi g plus psi of h, yeah, so this is um, writing or calculating plus psi of h here on both sides and minus psi of g on both sides, then I just get zero. Yeah, this is what I got out of this here. And now, just want to remark yes. that it's justified that you write minus also because you're talking about the abelianized fundamental group. So we are in an abelian group. Yes, that's, yeah. yes, that's, I thought I'd said that. <laughs> okay, so maybe, no, no, maybe, maybe you did. <laughs> yeah. Right, <laughs> okay. Say it again. And um, this is now just psi of the boundary of sigma two, right? Because what's the boundary? D sigma two. Um, because now if you take the boundary of this two simplex, well, it means I first omit the first verdict, so I get f here, so I should get plus f, and um, if I omit the second verdict, that is this one, so g could, should go in with a minus sign, and then h with a plus sign again, so we should get f minus h plus g, um, and then applied psi to it, so it should be psi of f minus psi g plus psi h. So I think we did not make a sign error. We get exactly what, I need, what we need here, yeah? So d sigma of two, that was just f minus g plus h, so this equation holds. And this is what we wanted to show, yeah? So if I take the boundary of a two simplex and I apply psi to it, I get zero. And because of linearity, if I now take a general two chain, yeah, and I apply the boundary operator, then I apply psi, also get zero. Okay, so finally we showed that psi actually vanishes on one boundaries and that means that we obtain an induced homomorphism. So hence, we obtain psi bar now on the singular one chains mod out singular one boundary, so in other words, on the first singular homology. Okay. 
uh, delinearization. Yeah, so the homomorphism psi descends to a map on homology. So now the assertion is that um, psi bar, of course, is an inverse of the abelianized Hurevich homomorphism. So to show injectivity and surjectivity, what we can simply do is we show that both compositions you can form out of these two maps are the identity maps. So this is what we need to do to complete the proof of the theorem. First thing is check that in this direction the composition is the identity. So first applying the abelianized Hurevich homomorphism, then psi bar, then this should give the identity on where this one starts, so on the abelianized fundamental group. So why is that true? So let's just compute psi bar of her abelian of, and now I have to start with an element from the abelianized fundamental group, so that is a homotopy class of loops, but considered as a coset um, of the commutator subgroup. So I, again, I use the notation AB for this. And of course, the, well, the descended homomorphism on the abelianization is defined just by applying the ordinary Hurevich homomorphism on a representative. So this is just her of F. In other words, inside the argument of psi bar, I just get F plus B1X here. Okay, so now again, psi bar is defined on representatives using psi. So what do I get out of F if I apply psi? Well, I get um, this, this path where I first walk from X naught to F naught, then to F, and then I take the path from X naught to F1 backwards, this one. And I consider this as the class in the abelianized fundamental group. And now, why is this F? I mean, of course, this should be F. And that is F because F was chosen from the fundamental group, meaning this F started and ended in X naught. So actually, these paths here also start and end at X naught. And actually, well, they are just the same paths. This is one path, and this is the path going backwards. Actually, if one would have done it ele elegantly, one could have said that the path um, gamma x naught should just be the constant path and it will be here f right away. But this is not even necessary because we're now in the abelianized fundamental group, right? So I know this is one loop starting at x naught and then x naught and this is its inverse. But since I'm in the, in the um, abelianized quotient, I can now just move it uh, up front here. I can exchange the order of those two and then these two cancel out. Yeah? And therefore, what I'm left with is just F, A, B. So it's true that this composition is the identity on the abelianized fundamental group. And finally, the other composition. So check her app after psi bar. This should be the identity on singular homology. So why is that true? Well, remember we've chosen this family of paths called gamma. Yeah? So to every point of the, X, of, of the space X, we get a path in um, X. And this um, assignment just now extends to a map from the singular zero chains to the singular one chains. So let me write that down. Note that this assignment gamma, which takes a point X in the space, and maps it to the path from x naught to x, which we chose once and for all. And this assignment extends to, well, a map which we still want to call gamma by abuse of notation. And this is now defined on the singular, zero singular chain group of x. And it goes to the first singular chain group of x. And well, what does it do? I take my point x in the space, well, and I just consider my path from x naught um, to x as a singular one simplex, as we have now done many times before. So let now sigma one be a one simplex. And now we first of all consider the composition of the Horevich, of the abelianized Horevich homomorphism 
with the ordinary psi, where I don't, don't write the overline here, meaning it's defined on the chain level, and therefore I can now apply this map to sigma one. Uh, sigma one is an upper index. And well, what do I get here? So the situation is, I can draw a quick picture. I've got my singular one simplex like this. I've got my base point x naught here. And what does C psi do here is, um, okay, I should also give an orientation. What does my psi do now? I go along here and then I go along here and then I go along here. So in other words, I can write this. I've got three um, one simplices. One, one of them is this one. So this is just the sigma one I started with. And then I've got these two ones, but it's, this is just connecting the base point with the two um, boundary points of the one simplex. So I can write this actually as minus gamma, where gamma is defined up here, this one, of the boundary of this one simplex, d sigma one. And since I've applied to Rivich, I abelianized, I have to consider this in the um, B1x here. Is that right? Where Rivich ends in the homology? Yeah. Thus, we can now calculate on the level of cycles that the composition of Hurewicz and Psi bar is, a, um, is the identity. So let's do this. Thus, Hurewicz abelianized applied to Psi bar of, and now I take not a chain, but a cycle, and I take the, homolo the homology class of a cycle. So I consider its coset with respect to boundaries. And well, psi bar is this descended homomorphism, but it's defined in terms of uh, evaluating it on a representative. So in fact, this is nothing else than her AB of psi without overline of C. And since the above relation here holds on a basis element, it also holds by linear, linear extension on linear combinations, yeah, on finite sums of those. So I can use the same relation here for this cycle here. And what I get from this is, um, this is just C minus gamma of DZ plus B1X. Okay, and now you see how the argument ends. Z is now a cycle, which means this in the argument here is equal to zero. Therefore, this whole sum is zero. And therefore, this is just Z plus B1X. And therefore, we end up with the same element we started with. This composition is also the identity, and the proof is complete.